Good morning and welcome to today's webinar on memos, comments, paraphrases, and document summaries, writing with Max QDA. My name is Dr. Michael Gizzi. I am a professor of criminal justice and a political scientist at Illinois State University in Normal, Illinois. I'm a professional trainer for Max QDA and offer consultations, virtual workshops, and a variety of tools. And I'm co-editor of a forthcoming book, The Art of Data Analysis, 10 Research Examples with Max QDA. You can reach me at uh, the easiest email is mgizzi, M-G-I-Z-Z-I, -Z -Z at gmail.com. Before we get started, I want to go over a few things. Um, I wanted to point out the fact that uh, thanks to uh, Verbi and Springer Nature, uh, it is still possible to get a free copy of the Kukart Saradaker book, Analyzing Qualitative Data with Max QDA, text, audio, and video. This is, as the graphic says, the ultimate Max QDA textbook. In many ways, uh, that, that is quite accurate. It is a full-fledged text that goes much beyond the uh, user manual, and it's free. So if you go to maxqda.com slash live dash training, you can get yourself a free copy. Um, also, if you do not have a copy of MaxQDA yet, you can go to maxqda.com slash trial, and the 14-day trial has been extended to 30 days. Then one last piece, uh, the good folks at Verbi have uh, created their own press, the Max QDA Press, and there's only a few things there now, but uh, free literature, guides, books about Max QDA, qualitative and mixed methods, uh, all available in PDF. The book that I'm co-authoring with Dr. Rodiker uh, will uh, actually be published by Max QDA Press, hopefully at the end of this year. So what are we going to do today? Um, this is a webinar focused on writing with Max QDA, okay. trying to talk about writing. keeping the site muted. Um, we do have the chat window, and that's what I would keep open on your screen. <laughs> this is a webinar that's focused on the tools that Max QDA provides you for writing. Um, you know, I, I think it's easy to think about MaxQDA simply as the software you use to do a content analysis, but it is so much more. And so today we're going to talk about memos, we're going to talk about coding comments, we're going to talk about MaxQDA paraphrasing, that's a topic that I actually offer a webinar on by itself, and we're going to talk about summarizing coded documents and the four different types of tools. Um, that that exist because there are so many things that I'm looking at. I'm going to do things a little bit differently than in my other webinars. Um, I'm going to begin actually with a PowerPoint presentation to go over all of these tools with screenshots, and then I will go live into uh, Max QDA and show you some of these. But there's so many things here that it's really impossible to do the step by step walk through for all of them. So um, I like to think of Max QDA as a writing toolbox. And I use Max QDA in classes with undergrads and graduate students. And when I when I use Max QDA as a research tool with them, I tell them it's not just to do the qualitative analysis, it's where they can do a lot of the writing that will become a part of their actual analysis. Um, and the four main tools <coughs> are memos, coding comments, paraphrasing, and for coded documents, summary tables. Memos are just what they look like. It looks like a sticky note, but it's much more than that. It can be a couple words, it can be a couple pages. It's where you write important analytical thoughts, where you take notes, where you raise questions. The nice thing about memos is 
they they are they exist anywhere you want them in the software. They can be tied to segments in documents, uh, tied to codes, tied to documents, or they can just be free memos floating out there. Um, and memos are fully searchable. Um, we'll talk about that. Coding comments are where you annotate a coded segment, um, and which you use to identify a key segment. Uh, uh, you view coding comments either in the right pane uh, in the document browser or or the sidebar uh, or in review retrieved segments and we'll talk about the difference between them uh, in a bit um, they're they're much more limited but yet they're equally important and powerful paraphrasing is a uh, feature that came about in Max QDA uh, in the last version, in the uh, 2018 version of Max QDA. And this is summaries of text or, docu or documents that are not tied to codes. Uh, very useful for developing literature review and can be used to identify concepts and documents if you're engaged in inductive coding. And then finally, summary tables. Summary tables are where you actually take coded segments and then further refine them and summarize what you coded and then build these really nice tables. And I'll, I'll explain that as well. They all come, they all have different uses. And so when we're thinking of Max QDA and writing, I encourage you to think big. You know, think you might think of Max QDA as just that tool that you use to content analyze data, but it's really an all encompassing tool for research. You, know, you can summarize materials from articles in a literature review using paraphrasing. You can take notes while you read and code a document, creating memos. You can annotate your coded segments to provide instant access to those sort of annotations when analyzing your data. You can write up your research results. You can store your analyses in free memos. You can build an annotated code book for your data with code memos. You've got all of these tools here. And uh, in fact, I have a student, and I'm going to show you an example. He used free memos in a way where he actually wrote the bulk of his paper in Max QDA. He had memos in which he focused on different aspects of of the paper, some of it was literature review, but here, you know, Scalia view on his job as a judge. And it, it was really quite powerful in terms of how he used memos to flesh out the research. And we'll get to the memo manager in a bit. So we'll start with memos. Memos are multifaceted. Um, as I said, you can use them to take notes, to track progress in your research, provide supplemental information about documents, uh, define and describe your codes, store your results, write drafts of your results. Um, anything, any output that you create in Max QDA, say it's a word cloud, you can copy that word cloud to the clipboard and then paste it into a memo, and it's there. <coughs> There are four different types of memos that we will cover. Document memos. These are a memo tied specifically to the document. Code memos. In-document memos, in which are tied to specific segments of text. And free memos, the floaters. Um, document memos are assigned to a document in the document system. Um, it's a way to kind of summarize that particular case or maybe even have notes on the progression of an interview. In document memos and in media memos, say you have video inside your, your, your project are attached to the data itself. Code memos are tied specifically to the code. And then again, free memos are whatever you want them to be. So when we're thinking about this, here's your document system. Here are all the documents, and wherever you see an icon there, it means there's a memo that's tied to it, a document memo. 
the code system the same. It's a code memo. And then an in document memo. So this text right here has been highlighted and a memo is created for it right here. And the uh, memos are neat too. And then I'll show you this live later. <coughs> If you hover over the memo icon, it, a pop-up will show up like this. So you don't even have to double-click it to bring in the full um, the full tool. When you create a memo, you have access to a memo editor, a standard input window, full uh, formatting functions, the ability to add in the date, change the font, add icons that you think are useful um, uh, uh, to kind of categorize the memo perhaps. Um, and you can tie codes to the memos. You can uh, link coded segments to the memos. So you, you have the ability to, to make them all interact. And again, I will show you the memo editor. Fully formatable and universal. So no matter what type of memo you're creating, the, the, um, the memo editor will look the same. So what do we use document memos for? I think of a document memo as, as, as a tool which we use to provide supplemental information for a specific document. This uh, example on the screen is from a uh, legal analysis of the uh, uh, legal the Supreme Court uh, writings of a uh, former justice, Antonin Scalia. And so these are all cases. And you'll notice each one of them has a document uh, memo next to them. I think of the document memo as a sort of a qualitative document variable where I store information about that document, but it's done in a free text mode as opposed to a variable, which is usually binary of some sort. Uh, text or a number. Uh, and it's easily viewable within the document system so that you can always to see what's going on. So for example, and this was done by a student, uh, as he was doing this content analysis for each case, and basically how we get to this is you double click on the icon. So you double click on it and it brings up the box and his document memos served to provide basically an overview of what that case was about for him. And he did this, he did this systematically for every single case. He examined over 60 legal decisions and he provided a great deal of detail there. So it would always provide him with the ability to know what that particular case was about. The different color tags uh, are about whatever you want them. Sarah, uh, your question is, what are the different color tags? This is, I, I generally wait to the end, but this is a good one. And what do they signify? <laughs> That's a great question. They signify whatever you want them to. You do not need to use any of those tags, but say you have a, some sort of a, categorization model where you're thinking about, okay, this is a particular type of case. So in this instance, this case is a right to counsel case. It's a Sixth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution case. You could use that particular icon if you wanted for all of the cases that were like that. You don't have to use them at all. The letters, I've never fully understood what they're there for, but they're literally just your choice. To, um, to use if, if something makes sense. You can also hover over a document memo. So I've got my mouse here and I'm hovered over uh, California versus Hodari D. I w if I keep the mouse there for about a second, this pops up. And so I actually see the document memo. Again, that works for memos throughout the program. So document memos are tied specifically to the document. There is only, there can only be one document level memo, okay? Code memos are basically the same thing, except they're tied to the code. 
So this was my student's project. These were his codes. This was his primary analysis. And he created a memo uh, for each code. He wasn't as systematic in what he included in there as I probably would be, but but that's okay. Um, I think the the most valuable thing about a code memo is it's a way to provide information that def helps you define why you created this code. What is what does this code mean? And so if you think about it, if you're doing a research project and you have a code book. Uh, all the basically all the definitions in your code book can come can be found in your code memos. The exact same tools um, hover over them, hover over the word stare decisis, and it brings up the memo that he created. And it was his attempt to sort of distinguish why he had this particular code created as opposed to other codes. The memo manager brings it all together. This was something that came out in MaxQDA 2020, uh, and it's a really powerful tool. Um, if in the memo manager lets you see all of your memos at the same time, and we will review this in, in a few minutes. This, uh, the PowerPoint part is moving quickly, so we're gonna have plenty of time to do live demos. Um, but it lets you literally click on free memos and it shows you all of the free memos in your project uh, right here if you click open in tabs you could have three or four or five of them open at the same time if i were to click to code memos it would show me all of the code memos the in document memos the in media memos the document memos memos tied to document groups and sets or code sets and the ability to search in the memos right from this tool. And then in addition to the, that, the memo manager lets you create free memos right from there. And I'll show you both of the ways you can create this without being in the manager. But it's a very powerful tool, uh, particularly since it also includes an export function that lets you export your, your memos out of uh, MaxQDA. Matthew, hey Matthew, good to see you. Um, would being able to code the contents of memos, being able to code the content of memos, be useful or a distraction? Well, one, you can't code memos uh, unless you exported the memos as a new document. Um, but I could see ways in which it could potentially be possible. Um, I'm, I'm not really certain 100%. Um, uh, I can actually also see how it could it could potentially be a distraction in that you spin things around. Later on, when I show you uh, the summary tables, um, that's a tool that you can export a table directly to a document. And then once it's a table document, and once you have that as a document, you could then code it. Um, I could see that potentially being valuable if you had a style of coding in which you wanted to further refine and create new codes. But the memos themselves are not codable uh, as memos. You would have to copy the memo and paste it into a new document. Hopefully that helps. In some ways, Max UDA is like a, it, it, it's like you go down the rabbit hole. There are so many ways and so many things you can use. Um, you have to always think about what's the most effective tool for what I'm doing. Uh, I'm glad you're enjoying it, Matthew. <laughs> Matthew is one of the authors in the new book coming out this fall. In fact, this particular project that you're seeing on the screen right now is actually going to be my case study in the book. Um, I've already talked about that. Uh, oops. <laughs> Just like in the classroom, yes, man, it becomes, starts to become too useful. Absolutely, Becky. I wanted to point out one other thing about memos. I probably should have did this from the start, um, but we'll do this live. Uh, there is now a tab in MaxQDA 20 with 
form memos by themselves. And here you can create a new free memo. And if you were to cl click on any of these right here, it'll automatically launch the, the memo manager. Uh, the overview of the memos will bring up all of your memos as like retrieve segments. And then the project memo is an, also a standalone memo. It's sort of a log where you could create a log of all the work you're doing in your project. For you good folks who follow all rules of research methodology and track what you're doing, uh, probably not a bad idea. And then the search tools right there as well. So I think that's the quick version of memos. There, there is one other part. Memos are the one tool we're talking about today that can be searched. Unlike code comments, unlike paraphrasing, you have full search functions for memos. You can either go into the memo manager or the memo tab and select search memos, or you can go to analysis, select lexical search, and select using in memos. So from the memos tab, the first method, it will bring up this dialog box and you can create a new search string and it will search anything in uh, that's in your one of your memos. So if you have a project with a lot of memos, I have an early project that I did that involved, oh God, uh, I, I, there were like 160 or 170 memos. At the time, I wasn't aware of the comments, the code comments tool. And so there are many things that would have been code comments, but they were all memos. The search function is really useful to be able to see, to find uh, key points. And, and then from lexical search under analysis, you'll notice here in documents or in memos. And you have the ability to just search your memos. However, it's not both, it's either or. Okay, let's switch to code comments. Code comments are used to add annotations to a coded segment. So you've, you're doing your analysis, you've got your focus group data and you're coding your data. And when you code a particular segment, you want to record some information about it. It might be, this is contradictory to something else, or this is really important. This is a valuable piece of information. Uh, you double click on the coded segment. I'm sorry, I'll show you on the on the on the in the sidebar, and it brings up a dialog box that lets you that lets you write a comment up to 255 characters. You're not required to. You don't have to. But I have found that it's it's extremely valuable, a valuable tool. And the reason why comments are valuable, even though they're not searchable, whenever you bring up your retrieved segment window to see all of the comments, all of the segments that you coded, the comments show up with them. They're created when you double click on the code that segment in the left pane of the document browser. Let me show you this. So I have coded this. This is from an interview with Justice Scalia right here. And the arrow here showing text and tradition. I double click. Oops, sorry. I shouldn't, I'm not live. I shouldn't do that. Uh, I double click on the word text and tradition. And this dialog box pops up. And here I write the comment. This was my student's comment. Um, and once you click on that, you now have a comment tied specifically to that data. I'll get to your question in a second. With how much volume? Yeah, I'll get to that in a second. Um, a lot. A lot of data. In fact, Matthew might want to enter a, a reply to that because I believe he did a project that was really, really big. 
have found code comments very useful to generate a list for suggesting to myself possible future code refinements, like whether I should merge, expand, or split a code. Thank you. That that that's that's spot on. That's spot on. Uh, the code comment tool. When I look at my early projects with MaxQDA, I was like, wow, I wish I understood this. Um, There's another way to add coded segments. You double click on the code in the, the code browser. It brings up the coded segments window. And all of the segments here, this is from the basic um, uh, life satisfaction project. And there were comments for two of those that were entered. And if you double click on the word comment here, you can actually add in the comment from just looking at the um, uh, coded segment. Uh, I prefer to do it live in the document because I'm not convinced that after the fact I'm going to remember, but it is a useful tool. And the nice part with the comments is anytime you bring up the coded segments, you see this. You will see your comments here. So let's point out once you have created the comment the right sidebar which is also a new tool in MaxQDA 20 uh, is really valuable because now the two comments I don't know why this is showing up twice uh, and I picked it as a graphic that's beautiful um, the comment shows up on the side I'm going, to, I'm going to point that out live in a little bit. Um, um, and so you have the ability in the document to see your comments as you scroll through it, or you have the ability to use the coded segment tool. Um, again, they're like memos. They're not as powerful as memos, um, yet they're tied to a specific use of a code. So. If you have the code search clarified and you code that five times, the comment only goes to the particular time that you're coding it. This gets us to paraphrasing. Paraphrasing is a tool that lets you write brief summaries of segments of text, not as a comment, not tied to a code, not tied to a memo, but a way to take a document and to literally paraphrase it, to break it down into its components. You want to distill a document, you want to put it into your own words. You've got several articles that you know you need to distill for part of a literature review. You bring those articles into MaxQDA, use the paraphrasing tool to summarize the documents as paraphrases, and then MaxQDA has the tools to let you see them all in order, and you have the, you know, you basically have the article broken down into its core parts. This can be really useful for a literature review, but it's also useful if you're not certain what your codes are going to be. And so I was working on a project with a colleague in, in business. Uh, on business strategy, a topic that I have no expertise in, and he gave me some materials to read and look at. I synthesized some of that using paraphrases and then used it to identify the concepts to build the codes that we were going to use. Paraphrasing is something you generally do before you code. Paraphrasing is not required. You never have to paraphrase if you don't want to. Um, I find it really valuable as a early step in a project. Paraphrasing is also useful if you want to do an early read of a document. You've got an interview that you know you're going to be coding, and or whatever, it doesn't matter what it is, and you want to sort of kind of go through a first run of how you think you might want to code it by using paraphrases. When you enter the paraphrase mode, all the other analysis tools are sort of locked until you um, 
um, till you either switch to a different tab or click on the paraphrase icon. But you go in the menu and you click on paraphrase. Uh, if you just double click on that, it'll bring you right into paraphrase document. But there are actually other tools here. You can view a matrix of all of your paraphrases, basically a long series of uh, uh, documents. Uh, with the paraphrases from multiple documents, or um, you have a way, we'll talk about categorizing the paraphrases as well, and you can print the document with the paraphrases. So it sort of would print like it looked like a Word document that was using, um, what's the word, uh, track changes. How do you paraphrase? You're in paraphrase mode, you're in a document, you highlight, this was a PDF, so this, we highlight this text, when I highlight the text, this window pops up, this dialog box pops up, I enter my paraphrase of it, click OK. I'm limited to 255 characters, just like a, a code comment. Click OK when I'm done. And then the paraphrase shows up in the right sidebar. The, the paraphrase text now turns green and a bubble appears in the sidebar. And if you hover over it, it will always show you what's, what, what's been paraphrased. If you hover over this, it will show you what's been paraphrased. Uh, once you've created a single... I'm not sure if I understand how a paraphrase is different than a memo. It's a good question. Let's think about memo. In, in responding to that, um, think about the uh, a in-document memo versus a paraphrase. An in-document memo is something you have available to. Um, uh, that is fully searchable. It will show up tied to that retrieve segment. Um, it, it's always there. Um, I like that. Matthew's answer. Paraphrase is the text in your summary form. Memo is what you might think about it. Um, I think of paraphrasing as important primarily if I'm interested in literally summarizing the document that I can use in other ways. Uh, or if I'm trying to build a code book. Um, I think it's, it's functions are, are you're, you're absolutely right in that um, there, there are very much similarities. You could do everything with memos if you wanted to. If you're working, look at this, I don't have to answer questions, the group is doing it. If you're working between languages, paraphrasing is useful to check your comprehension and translation issues too. I think so, that makes sense. Paraphrase retains the original voice. Uh, it lets you create a basic summary. Um, I sort of look at it as something I do early. Once I once I start coding, I never go back and uh, never. I don't know. I should never say never, but I rarely would go back and then start paraphrasing again. Uh, but there's sort of it's a unique function. Um, I think it has, its two primary means, though, are for literature reviews, for summarizing uh, a, a ma material that you don't need to code, um, and uh, for building, inductively building a code book. Uh, hopefully that helps. Once you've created a single paraphrase segment, um, the code system will now show you a, uh, a paraphrase segments and if you double click on that it will bring up a dialog box showing you all of your paraphrase segments uh, and I think I kept that graphic yeah okay and so here we go in this business project and these are all paraphrases that were created you'll notice it's similar to code comments right in that in the instead of the uh, the coded segments Instead of comments here, we see the paraphrase here. So I click on this, it shows you what, how we paraphrased it.
So you've paraphrased your document, your literature. <laughs> the neck, and you you want to use it to uh, you want to use these paraphrases, perhaps to create that literature review, or perhaps to to build codes. Categorizing paraphrases as a tool that lets you easily organize all of your paraphrase segments and create codes from them. You can drag and drop to move paraphrases within the tool uh, to organize them. You can link paraphrases to existing codes or add new ones. Uh, and so here is a categorized paraphrases window, and it shows us all of your paraphrases. And if I were to click on this, I could hover over it. I could drag this anywhere I want, reorganize the paraphrases. Here are all of your codes. If I were to highlight this compete against rivals, I could, I don't know, I could say I wanted this. I could drag this to it and it would end up over here. And I'll, I'll try to show that if there's time. Um, we have a full uh, webinar on paraphrasing and the, it's not online. The video for it is not up yet, but I'm, uh, that should be in the next few days. Um, so let me show you an example. This was a graphic. This is a really interesting chart about business strategy. I paraphrased each of these items here. Okay, They all showed up here. So I started with that. I went into categorize paragraph uh, paraphrases and I cr I right clicked on each of these and I created a new code and new codes were built based on the paraphrase. It's a really powerful function. Again, it may not be necessary and for some of you it may not be um uh, it it may not be needed, but earlier on there was a Sonia wrote. I guess it's mainly a technical difference. You can do different things with it. Uh, absolutely, absolutely right. You can do different things with it. Uh, coded comments don't does, they don't have this categorized para, uh, paraphrase tool. Um, the ability to reorganize them to uh, build a um, coding system out of them. They're more of an annotation. This is more of a summary, a summary that's of value. You know, Matthew, I use paraphrase a lot if the original author was a bit long-winded or meandering and I want to re-articulate the salient points. Excellent, spot on. Uh, this gets us to the last element I want, to, I want to touch on briefly, document summaries. Up to this point, memo, memos may be tied to a coded segment, but paraphrasing, uh, uh, yeah. paraphrasing is summarizing before you code. Document summaries are where you have created, where you have coded segments, and you want to look at all of the segments that you coded the same way and further refine and summarize them together. And Max UDA has two tools, the summary grid and, and its companion, the summary table. So let me show you the summary grid. <coughs> what we have here, here, and this is from a different project, here we have all of the codes. Here are the documents. And you'll notice this one here is not blue. There's not green around it. Here was the coded segment. This is what was coded. This was a wrongful conviction research project. My student then took that and re reduced that coded segment into this. Police successfully threatened defendant to implicate co-defendant and, and to confess. He reduced a long paragraph into something very succinct. And when he and the way he did this was you clicked on this, it brought this up, he entered this summary. And as soon as he does that, it turns green around it, showing you that it's been summarized. And once you, and you'll notice here, all of these are green. So wherever these codes exist, they're green. He did it for all of them. He then clicked on summary table 
and he created a sorry he created a table of all of the uses of violence or the threat of violence and he, his result the result was that his data was now he has okay here are all the instances where police used violence or the threat of violence against suspects and here are all the documents the names of the wrongfully convicted and a brief summary of of how, what type of violence was used and this is an example i really thought this was a spectacular use of max uda by the student he read the documents that we had he coded them he then summarized the codes down to basically a, a brief sentence or not even a full sentence but something quite succinct and then created a table that enabled him to sort of see to visualize and refine the analysis this is perfect because he could then write about this. He could talk about the fact there were 18 cases involving violence or the threat of violence against suspects by police. And in those 18 cases, we saw several examples of things that happened. And in fact, this is where we could go down that rabbit hole if we wanted to, because we could actually save this table as a new document and then we could actually code this the these examples if we wanted to so we started with something broad and something narrow does the summary table wind up in the smart publisher report matthew i truly don't know the answer to that question um i, I just i don't know maybe so, so Summary tables are very different than everything else that we've looked at. But here it's also about writing. You know, we're taking, because the writing process isn't just, you've got the data and now you need to take this data and you need to be able to write it up. And that writing process requires you to synthesize to deal with what you have. And here we went from these quite complex coded segments relatively long and reduced it into a series of simple tables until it's a series of simple tables so ultimately these tools provide you with a lot of resources that let you tra you transform raw data into written material to take notes to annotate coded segments to write out analyses and to summarize your findings how you choose to use them is up to you. You could be the person who says, look, I'm just using it for content analysis. That's fine. I'm doing that, and then I'm doing everything else in Microsoft Word. All right, fine. That works. But the point is, Max UDA as a, for a research project, you know, ultimately, you're not going to write your final paper in, as a free memo. I, I seriously doubt you're going to do that. But Max QDA as a research tool is so broad and so encompassing, it gives you the ability to look at, to, to, to be a full research notebook, to tie it all together, to tie it all together. Um, are you going to use all of these? No. It really is going to depend on what your project is. All right. I'm going to do some some live examples for a while, but I do want to go back to that Kukarts and Rodiker book. Um, it's an essential guide, and it's free. Grab yourself a copy of the analysis of uh, of data with Max QDA. It's well worth your time. Okay. I guess. <laughs> so let's see now we are live um i can make this full screen i want to start with memos real brief 
overview of this stuff. I'm not going to be able to do a step-by-step -step of how you do everything here. I think I'm going to actually create a new webinar just on memos. Uh, I think there's more than enough there for a full webinar. But if we go to the memo tool, uh, toolbar, uh, menu bar here, uh, and on a Mac you also have memos here, but you PC users miss this joy. Um, notice, free memos, code memos, in document. Click on free memos. It brings up the memo manager, and it's bringing me up all of the all of the free memos that were created by my student notice i hover over and it actually shows here uh, what he did uh, when he proving that there are distinct steps uh, when he contradicts them you can see the amazing amount of work and the analysis being done by this undergraduate here, as he's content doing his content analysis, he keeps going back into this free memo and adding information to it. It's a great example of it. Um, I switch to code memos. Here I have all the codes, and then I can see exactly what he created, or I can click on it, and it'll it'll bring it up as a full document. I double click, it shows it in an aggregated form. Uh, and I can export the when the memos uh, or, uh, out of Max QDA. So if I want to get these into a word processor as separate files, I can do that. Uh, but of course, I could also just copy, paste uh, the memo wherever I wanted to. Notice here, I want to create a new free memo. It pops it up right in the manager. I want to keep track of when I'm entering the memos. I can insert the date. I can change the fonts. I have all sorts of tools uh, available to me. I can link this memo to a particular code so that it will provide me the ability to sort of know sort of what, what this is tied to. Ah, I, I don't know if this will work here, but I also yesterday uh, created a memo using, ah, my gosh, it did work. So I created a memo, uh, there's no content to it, but this was an actual interview of uh, Justice Scalia. And I have a memo and a code that I, that I, I coded it there, and I can see them right in between the multimedia browser and I can see them um, in the in the memo manager. I'm going to go to a document. Supreme Court case. I uh, format this a little bit better. I want to create a memo uh, I, I, about anything. Say this text was interesting to me. I highlight it. I right click it. I insert a memo for that selection. And I add the demo memo. Now, after I've done that, the memo shows up here. I can highlight, I can hover over it. The memo shows up here. 
as long as I have memos uh, highlighted. I can use memos, comments, or paraphrases. I can't do, I can do memos and comments or memos and paraphrases. I can't do comments and paraphrases. It's one or the other. It's just the, the way the software is. Yeah, the multimedia memo is really cool. That was a fun uh, exploration yesterday. Uh, and I was all proud that I found that video. And then after I imported it, I realized that he had actually had a transcript of that video already in the project. But uh, it's really useful. Um, document memos. Double click on it right there. And this is the memo that the student created. And for the case, he actually tied it to uh, several different uh, codes. This was a Fourth Amendment case, so he linked it to that. Uh, let's say I want to create, pretend this is a document, since he's got them for all of these. Um, does he? No, this one doesn't have one. So I double, I right click it. I create a document memo just like that. And now I have the, this is the document memo. Very simple. I, I don't like that memo. I can delete it. Oh, bingo. Here's something that was asked about earlier. Right click on that memo, convert the memo into a document. Now I have a document in this project that is the full text of the memo. And if we want to go spiraling, if we want to go in the other direction, we have the ability to code that memo at that point. Uh, I'm not certain I would do that, but it's possible. So document memos, everything that's true about code memos, it's the exact same thing, okay? So code memos, I click on a free memo, um, overview of memos, I can see all the memos in this project, and there's a lot of them. David was busy. Project memo, you can use this as your project log sort of to keep track of what you're doing and when. Search and memos. That's the name of the case we were just looking at. Run the search. And it actually brings the search of the memos up in the memo manager. How is that? because you're searching memos, okay? Analysis, lexical search. If I do Sorry, this- I'm not sure. If I do this search in the documents, I see where this key, the word ren shows up. I do the lexical search in memos, and it's going to bring it back to that. So all memo searches end up in the memo manager. It's a one stop tool. I want to see how to create a paraphrase. I'm going to open a new project. So this is a project, it's called the Cuomo Project. I've actually been collecting all of the transcripts of over the over 100 daily press briefings that New York Governor Andrew Cuomo has given during the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And uh, I am interested in exploring his, his press briefings as an example, as in, in, in terms of rhetoric and leadership. I also have several of the uh, 
president's uh, press conferences, which I also uh, downloaded the transcripts of, um, and I might do some comparisons with, but this project hasn't even really begun. But I identified some literature and I wanted to do a literature review on moral leadership. So here's an article that I have. <coughs> You'll notice here on the right sidebar, I've got paraphrases selected. So I hover over these and you can see what I've already paraphrased. So let me show you how to create a paraphrase. So I'm interested right here. I've got this section on power. I go to analysis. I was already there apparently. And I click on paraphrase. Now I see what's already been paraphrased. You'll notice here I left out this particular one. I'm paraphrasing a lot here, more than I probably should, but they're major points. I highlight this text. I release it, and now, oops, hang on a second. The software is in the way. Um, I highlight the text, I release it, and now I can enter my summary. Power fills a vacuum. simple summary there and now I actually have a whole series of kind of the main points here that have been paraphrased I can I'll show you the matrix because that's really useful I could then click and say I want just this document what happened Now you'll notice, it's really useful if you got multiple documents because they'd be side by side. Here are all the paraphrases in the in this document. And you know, this text, it really sort of, I have literally synthesized the major points. Burrell argues that there are five basic laws of power which apply wherever and whenever power appears. Power fills a vacuum, it's always personal, blah, 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 blah. Um, what a, a powerful tool. I don't need to code all of this, but I'm trying to synthesize it. And so the matrix lets me do that. I want to create codes. I go to categorize paraphrases. And now, and you'll notice the system has no, if there's like one code that I created the last time I gave this web, a webinar. Um, Leadership and leader. Many of these I would not create codes on. Um, but say I'm interested in this topic right here. I can right click it, create and assign a new code. Institutional power. Code memo. I can create my code memo right from the start. Let me show you how I actually do this. I'm gonna back out of here. I think what I paraphrase is the beginning of the code memo. I double click the text, highlight it, copy it, then create and assign a new code. Paste the paraphrase into the code memo. And now I have a code that has its own memo as well. This tool is really, really useful. It gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, I don't, I want to reorganize this, I drag it. I can move things. There is a lot of tools here.
There's a lot of tools here. When I'm done with the categorizing paraphrases, this actually ha is, a, is a tool that I have to actually hit quit on. Um, it's sort of like uh, Max Maps, and it's a sub-application. It, it needs to be closed. There are 30 paraphrase segments here. I double click. It brings all of the paraphrases right here. So we're in a document. I'm just going to make this up right here. I'm going to code a new code. Uh, We got a code. I want to create a comment of the code. I double click, and the way I do that is I double click on the co the code itself. Now I can create a comment, and so I could say, you know, so this is May first. And now I have a code comment. Now you don't see this here. Why don't you see this here? It's because we are showing paraphrases. I switch it to comments and now we see uh, the code comment. So I want to show you one more thing. I'm going to go to a different project for that. <laughs> Summary grid. All right, I need to simplify this. Hang on one sec. This, there's a lot more data here than I want. So we're going to look just at cases involving police conduct. I'm going to go to analysis, to mix methods, activate documents by variables. I've already created a police misconduct variable. And so I'm activating only the police misconduct cases. And I go to a summary grid. I can ignore the rest of this. And you're going to see here. Oops. All right. So pretend there was no summary here. Notice it's blue, it's not green. I click on this, I see the text, and I see the summary. I click on this, I read this, I then type out the summary. It's big text because I made it big. I can do whatever I want with this. I saw I have a grid here. I all of these cases have been summarized. I switched to summary tables. Violence or the threat of violence. And now I've I actually had to create this table. Uh, and I've got it all broke down there. And I have the ability where to go to. Insert the summary table as a table document in the document system. If you look at his document system, I now have a document that is exactly what I've summarized. 
And so in doing so, I now have the ability to look at a lot of data and I could code that. I know that's a quick rundown of some of those tools. I hope this has been valuable for you. Uh, Max QDA offers a lot, and I think you you have a lot of tools. You're not going to learn all of this right now in a simple webinar. Uh, there was much more there than we could we could cover. With that, we're going to call it a day. Stay safe out there, everybody. And this is a these are crazy times. So be good.